negative fluid tests, that, that there are women that have had negative fluid tests and positive capsules. And that's something that's, um, you know, it's still being looked at. So I don't think that you can tell a woman who has a negative fluid test they're 100% in the clear. Um, it, it, the odds are that they're more likely in the clear, but they should know that there are a few people out there that have had that situation. And hopefully, you know, the experts are evaluating those, but that's something that's ongoing. And we're, they're making decisions in real time. And again, cancer, pro, you know, progresses every day. And if you have it and it's still sitting in your body, that's, you know, that could be affecting your ultimate prognosis and your life. And so no one should be telling anybody, you had a negative test, you're fine. Because again, if you're really up on the latest, and which is real time, real information from women and not waiting for an article, which is delayed, then you will know that there are women with negative cytology, negative fluid, positive capsules. And there may be reasons for that. Maybe the lab made a mistake. It may be there wasn't enough fluid um, there's lots of reasons, but it may just be the fluid was negative. What do you, do y'all have, why do y'all think that's the case? Why, why is our, are there, I mean that's, in the, and that's the lesser of the presentations, but why do y'all think that? I'm just curious. That why. there's a negative yeah, fluid why? and a positive capsule? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's possible, well I think there are women that, that have this lymphoma and never get a seroma. So, you know, I'm not an oncologist, but that tells me that, you know, these cancer cells, they develop in the capsule, um, they could stay there and not cause a seroma. And maybe the seroma is developing just from chronic inflammation. And so they have seroma from chronic inflammation. The chronic inflammation is causing lymphoma, but the lymphoma is not in the seroma, or at least not in enough quantity for it to be detected on the test, but it's still there in their capsule. A lot of the testing and research that we've focused on and, and funded at, at ASERF, which is the Aesthetic Society Education Research Foundation, most of that's been done by Marshall Caden, who's a world-renowned dermatopathologist. And Marshall really, this is one thing maybe the Facebook group can help with, is he really needs to get seroma samples um, they can, they can, they can, they don't have to be necessarily fresh. That's great if they are. Uh, there's, we can talk about the details, but he really is hoping to, to be able to have some tests and cytokine tests that will actually help, you know, not only diagnose, but also stratify risk. And, mm -hmm. and so that's one thing there. So and, I, and, I and you heard. reminded me of that because it, you bring up a, you know, you bring it, there, there's some kind of conundrums, you know, in, in this disease that we haven't, totally explain right. and you, yeah like you talked about one scenario the other, the other thing would be the opposite you know the people that have just cells in the fluid but no no other cells anywhere else and where are those cells coming from and then there's there's you know there's progressions of those so that's the one thing with research and and you know certainly at ASURF we um, have really tried to focus in on what you know what we can do to try to develop a better way for the patients to, to be diagnosed and to be treated and, and so we need, but we need seromas. Right, and actually one of the women that I mentioned, I didn't say her name, but I gave her Dr. Caden's name. Yeah. And, um, and so I'm hoping that she does get him some of her seroma yeah. because it, it tested negative, but it keeps recurring. She has textured implants. Um, and you know, so she, so we, we are aware of that and um, we have his contact information and so hopefully we can, you know, help, help solve the, this puzzle. One of the things that, I mean, we're probably, our perspective is quite progressive. So one of the things that we're not seeing is capsular contracture being tested. So I had no symptoms. I had, I had no noticeable fluid, no noticeable swelling, no pain. Um, I went in for standard re-op. I had a ruptured implant from a mammogram, routine re-operation. And because on visual inspection, my tumors were so large that my physician then sent them to pathology. I, I think in, in my country, thing, everything's sent to pathology, but thank goodness the right test was run. So my, my diagnosis is terrifying. 
no symptoms, standard re-op, just bad timing or great coincidence? Would we like to see capsular contracture tested? Absolutely. How expensive is the test? I don't know. The cheaper the test is, the more opportunity we can have to have true incidence. Because unless we're testing textured implants that are coming out of women's bodies for a variety of reasons, you know, incident rates are still a best guess. Why did, why did a surgeon choose to become a plastic surgeon? You know, one of the interesting shifts, you know, I love, I love humanity and I love organizational behavior. If I chose medicine and then I chose a subspecialty called plastics, one of the things I'm going to guess that you chose, Dr. Adams, I, I don't know this to be true, is that I chose not to give a lot of bad news. I chose to be the kind of doctor who's restorative and am going to take somebody who's in a position today and make them in a better position. Right? I mean, that, this is what plastics is to me. Now we're asking those same surgeons who chose not to give cancer diagnosis, we're asking those same surgeons, instead of being at the end of a cancer treatment, we're asking plastic surgeons to step, step in front, recognize the signs and symptoms. We're asking you to test and diagnose, and now we're asking you to deliver the news. So in a very, in a very, you know, if we couch some of this in humanity that nobody wants to talk about, we talk about statistics and we talk about symptoms and we talk about rare. The human side of this disease says, we just asked the subset of surgeons to become cancer deliverers. We find surgeons, some of the responses that we see on women who are diagnosed, it's almost like the surgeon takes their diagnosis personally. It's not personal. You know, nobody, why I have lymphoma? You know, the, the causality and the cause aren't the same thing. We're still working on causality, right? Epidemiology is not yet determined. There's some really amazing theories, but at this point, there's only one determination. We only have one common denominator. I don't know that we're addressing sort of that human side of plastic surgeons having to now say, I'm sorry, but you have a cancer diagnosis, because I believe that's a defining moment in somebody's career. And we have seen from feedback from patients that plastic surgeons, once they've seen a case of these so-called rare people, right, that something shifts in them. Their, their practice shifts, the type of implant they're using shifts. You know, I think it was Dr. Diva on, on a deep dive series that said, you know, the humanity of this is that every plastic surgeon, if you're not stopping and this smoking gun isn't paused to address what your practice is supposed to look like. Like, when I see in my country, I see surgeons in their early 40s on news media saying that breast implants are absolutely safe as a statement. You know, that statement isn't true any longer. And, and so we're just, I think we're changing a dynamic. And, and I'm sorry that it's happening, but it's happening. Right, and I think, you know, patients have compassion for their doctors. You know, anytime I have an appointment, you know, I'm grateful that a doctor went into medicine because I wouldn't want to deal with this day in and day out. I mean, I have to as a patient, but, you know, I can choose when I don't deal with it. You know, it's not full in my face, but a doctor, every day, they have to deal with it. And they have to, and they feel responsible. And they feel, and they're human, and, and so I feel, compassion and I feel gratitude to my doctor that they're willing. You know, we're, we're all human and we all are vulnerable and we're all just trying to do our best. And I think that's, you know, just do your best. And, and, and I think at the end, you know, we'll all feel good about the outcome. The good thing about this is that, you know, I think we're learning a lot about this. We know a lot more than about some other things. Uh, the with the proper diagnosis and treatment, you know, the outcomes are, are really good. Um, so we, we do treat, you know, we treat skin cancer, we treat some things that are, have far worse prognosis, you know, so it's not that we don't do it, it's, it's, it is different. I know, know what you're saying, Terry. But I do think kind of knowledge is power, you know, and I think the more we learn about it, I'm very confident that, you know, in working with you know, people like you that are doing great work and doing great research that, that we're really going to get ahead of, 
of this issue and as we learn more and more we're going to be able to you know treat people better and and diagnose it quicker and and hopefully maybe even eradicate it through practices or or therapies so I think that look is, is good but I, I would congratulate you all especially for being such a great resource because you know like we kind of talked a little bit about in, the, in this round table that that doesn't really exist so hopefully patients and physicians are watching this know that there's the, the resource that you all are providing the work that you're doing and and then with that kind of collaboration hopefully not only will the patients get the best treatment they can and and the prompt treatment that, that they certainly deserve but hopefully we can get ahead of this problem and at the end you know uh, deal with it the best we can. Right, And there is an emotional component and that's where we can come in you know we understand the emotions and we can present the information and also help with the emotions surrounding it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and um, you know absolute statements right I guess I've I've you know I've changed right cancer's changed me so there are very few absolute statements in my in my life. I don't believe that we're going to have 100 percent empowerment of patients nor are we going to have 100% awareness by all plastic surgeons. But if we can come up with a select few, you know, today we sit in Dallas, we all flew to Dallas. So if we have a patient who's demonstrating symptoms, struggling to get tested, you know, we want to take that patient and say, in this city, Dr. Adams is who you need to go see because he's going to follow the protocol. That's a piece of like that's the peace of mind that we need, and but that and these women need. And every change is exponential, you know. Just your decision to do the the New York Times article affected me, and then I've affected others, and it's just going to be exponential. And that's how that's how all change happens in the world. So don't minimize, you know, any doctor telling one doctor that. I mean, every doctor I've seen since my diagnosis, it's been new, news to them, and they've educated others in their hospital. And because I moved, you know, I've educated doctors in Atlanta. Um, my nurse, when I was getting Prentuximab, she was, why are you getting Prentuximab? And I told her, you know, and she said, oh my God, I had, I have textured implants because I had a mastectomy. I was the person giving her that news as she's giving me Prentuximab. It, it is exponential. So any person you communicate with, there's a rippling effect. And yes, maybe it's never going to be 100%, but the more awareness, the more lives that are saved. Yeah, that was great. And I think it's, it's really been a great round table. You know, I think you guys have, have done incredible amounts of work and I know you're gonna to continue to do that. And I hope, you know, you all did all take time out of your day and expenses to come down to Dallas. It's so nice and cool for you here. That, uh, <laughs> uh, but we really appreciate that. And I think our viewers really will have enjoyed, you know, this conversation and, and hopefully y'all will come back and, and share some more progress with this as time goes on but I think that there's there's definitely certainly the resource that you all are providing it's um, it's really is doing a big taking a big stride to create an awareness about about breast implant and ALCL so thank you. thank you thank you and if you want to see more of this you can see it on the plasticsurgerychannel.com mm -hmm.